So, okay, so today's workshop uh, is about securing uh, your APIs at design time. And uh, I'm here today with Isabel Moni, which is our field CTO at 42 Crunch. And um, myself, is, uh, I'm Pierre Prever, and I'm head of pre sales for EMEA. And what will we go through today is really a lot of guidelines that you should uh, follow when you're designing APIs. The thing we see the most the problems we see the most that you should fix when you're building APIs so that you have, at the end of the day, secure APIs that you can open to the world. And uh, we talk a bit about our product, but basically it's really gener generic guidelines and it's not limited to our uh, products. Obviously, it's really what we saw uh, in the field. And we will start with something that we hear a lot when, uh, when we are contacted, you know, for or a proof of concept of our solution when we discuss with people who manage API security and or manage security in a company, actually, and they want to secure, you know, their API. Uh, what they, what we often hear is, we know we have a lot of APIs. We we just don't know where they are or what they do. And if it tells something, uh, it's that we totally failed as an industry to to do something secure. And uh, the way we build things, the way we put things in production, the way we design things, or uh, there's something wrong in what uh, in what we do because we put things in production and security teams do not know what they are, what they do, and that's something we should fix. And the, the way security teams uh, traditionally address these kind of problems uh, is by saying, okay, so now I've got to buy a tool that will help me find things that I don't know where they are. And then I will try to buy another tool or, or maybe it's the same tool that will try to guess how things work so that I can fix them. And yeah, we, we're doing something wrong because how, where things are and how things are done are something that is known. And it's, it's something that is known by the developer. And it all, really, it all comes to the data validation pyramid, which basically means that the more you know about something, the more you, you can create things about what is a load on your API, what your API should do, what it should accept, and only what, what it accepts. And the less you know about something, the more you will try to define things you don't want or you know, try to do guesswork or use AI or you really think about things work. This all are, they all have legitimate uses but at the end of the day if you really want to inc uh, increase your security posture you will have to work on what your api should do and should accept and reject everything else and developers have this knowledge right so an all list is basically you know uh, only, only only numbers between 1 and 1024 on this specific parameter right that's something that the security guy cannot do because it doesn't know about that. It doesn't know about the API. It doesn't know what it does. Uh, a denial list would be, you know, to block a specific uh, IP address or range. And uh, yeah, heuristic would be something like, yeah, detect tokens used over multiple IPs and things like that. And at the end of the day, you might require all of that, but to have really a good uh, proper core security foundation, you should uh, work upon building a, a good a low list. Isabel? Yeah, and, and the question is, how do we do that? Um, so this is, you know, problem number one that really we see at, uh, at most customers is they're missing and complete uh, or unshare what we call API contracts. What, what is that? You know, your developers and uh, what the people in, in the room are, are do, doing here, if you want to say in the chat, that will help us also focus some of the um, some of the, uh, the messages that we are giving you this morning. Um, typically, you know, a, an API contract is simply defining what does my API does? You know, how is it secured? Like, is it an API key? Is it uh, using OAuth? Is it using OpenID Connect, et cetera? Well, we talk about this. Um, and, and also, what are the operations? Like, can I do a post? Can I do a get? Um, what is the data in? What is the data out? So everything about how do I interact with this API? Traditionally, this is something that has been used for documentation. You know, maybe five, 10 years ago when this all started, 
that's really the tools and the frameworks and, and every, all the ecosystem around what was called at the time swagger. You may have heard about this as swagger, right? Um, was really geared towards documenting an API so that the consumers of that API will actually know what it does. And we, you know, like a contract, you know, a contract is all about, I, you know, sign here that this is what my API is going to do so that when you use that API, well, you know, and you can count on the fact that actually it does that. Um, now this has changed and evolved a lot, you know, now, first of all, we have much richer, um, uh, API definitions, uh, sorry, uh, contract definition uh, standards uh, like Open API version three, like async API. So if you're using WebSockets, so in things like um, you know Kafka or anything asynchronous, you also have a way to describe that in things which are really de facto standards that are backed up by the Linux Foundation. So. You know, this is not like a little thing used in the corner. This is probably something like 70, 80% of all the APIs right now are described uh, through those. And, and there's a huge ecosystem around this as well. So um, you can really do a, a lot with them. We'll talk about this in a second. And what is really uh, critical here is as well, this can really be used as a common language across everyone. So that we see this at a lot of our customers, you know, when some person in API, in AppSec needs to test an API, you know, they need some kind of information. I was like, okay, I have to test this. I have to do some kind of pen testing in API. How do I know what it does? And every single API is different. They all have different data and different things that they do. So very often what we see uh, is actually, um, and, and more and more an open API file given to those teams as input. So say, hey, this is what my API does which is way be better than, you know, sending them an Excel or, you know, something like this to tell them this is what the API does, which we still see at some customers. Um, and, and the great advantage of having this is really that it becomes and enables a movement we call API design first. So you start with the contract. You start by defining this is what my API is going to do. And then from there, you can do a lot of things, you know, and, and there's a, this link in the, in the slide on openapi.tools, which is a great, um, you know, um, a reference of all the tools, many of the tools that are available around OpenAPI itself. And, and, you know, what do we see our customers doing? For example, we'll start from an interface, being able to generate a mock-up of the API. So while the backend team, the API team is producing the API, the front-end team, maybe that's writing a web application or a mobile application can actually start working. They don't have to wait until the backend is done to be able to implement uh, their application because they have this mockup that gives them the same information. You can do automated testing. We see more and more AppSec tools like Zap and Burp that take OpenAPI as an input. So there's a huge number of things at, along the API lifecycle across all the different teams that can be taken advantage of because you have a formalized contract which is actually written. Right, so it is really, and it's really a strong movement right now to have those contracts established, written, uh, and kept up to date. And, and you have multiple tools that will show you that allows you to actually make sure that the implementation is always in sync with the actual interface itself. Yeah, so first, uh, if you don't have you know, a contract or if you want to follow this workshop and click yourself in, in our interface to, 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 to see how it works, we've got a bunch of resources that are available at uh, this address and that you can clone this repository. And actually, I will click on it and you will see that on the, um, for instance, on the firewall deployment, you will have uh, OAS files, which are basically contract uh, open API contract that you can uh, retrieve and that we will actually see during uh, this workshop uh, to actually, you know, see or to improve a contract to actually uh, tell you, uh, you know, all you can do with that. And also, uh, we, you've got uh, our wonderful website, which is platform.42crunch.com. Yeah, you can create a, an account easily with GitHub, Google, and Azure. It's free. Uh, we will also go through our, in a second, in the Visual Studio, you will see our plugin for audit is also free. So you can, you know, cre create an account and you can start importing API contracts, open API specification and see all the score. We will get to that. 
So yeah, let's let's get to 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 actually uh, seeing a, an open API contract, what it looks like, what it does, and it's actually you know you you've got two ways of writing open API specification. One is you know with YAML, uh, the other one is with JSON. Here it's a JSON uh, open API specification, and this open API specification basically describe everything that your API does, uh, what it accepts, what it outputs, and you know the security attached to each endpoint or globally to the API. So you will define everything. And we've developed a plugin, which is you know community uh, free. You can totally use it, install it uh, in Visual Studio. You just, um, oh, sorry. Oh, because I'm sharing, I've got this, uh, okay. Let me, uh, this, this, maybe this, key. to disable that. Yeah, it's better. Okay. So you've got this plugin, which is open API, uh, Swagger editor that you can install. You know, it's uh, used by uh, more than 200,000 uh, developers ar across the globe. That's the plugin that we, we did. And this plugin actually allows you to navigate uh, into your open API specification into the different section really easily and also to audit your specification to see what's missing what what you should do to make this API contract more secure all the things that you can do and if I go to the open API specifications that I uh, that I open and that I yeah like that when I actually what you can actually do is, you know, click on the left panel API, you would be able to navigate through the different sections. So, you know, uh, an open API specification has different sections. For instance, in version two, you would have this swagger thing defined there, the host information, the base pass, everything. And you can click to navigate across the different section. And you can also see all the paths of your application. And when you click on that, you can see, you know, the get, the parameters, the response. You can go to that really easily to see what your API does and how it does it, right? And how you can specify it. You see all the operation and you can see, you know, the response defined and the security things that are defined. For instance, we've defined a security access token, right? Here, that will be used on the different endpoints. So yeah, so we've got this way of navigating on the left panel and on the top right thing, uh, you have actually uh, our plugin or audit plugin that you can click and that will realize an audit, a free audit actually of your API. And it, you just need to, to send us an email address so that uh, we send you a token to register and, and you, you'll you be able to actually perform an audit. And if I run an audit just on this open API specification, what you can see here is that the uh, security audit score is uh, 50 out of 100. And we break down things uh, uh, in two broad categories, which is one, the security uh, part, uh, the second, the data validation part. Security part will be, you know, everything across um, authorization, authentication, and whether or not you're using, for instance, a safe transport such as, such as HTTPS, or um, basically if you are using tokens, like static tokens over HTTP, uh, you would have uh, a really bad score in security. If you're using, for instance, OS2 with OpenID Connect and um, you over HTTPS, obviously, and it's a OS code one, you would have, you know, a pretty good score. And data validation is all about, you know, you've defined what your API uh, input and what your API accepts as input, what your API outputs, and but have you defined that precisely? And for instance, we can see just, below you know all the issues that you have in your api you can actually click to directly go through the issue in your file there and you can see we okay we've defined a token but we haven't defined a maximum length so what basically it says is that your api contract states that your api accepts any length for this particular string as input and, and it shouldn't you you know your api contract should define exactly what are the constraints of your parameters one, because it's good for the clients to actually know what they can do and with what they cannot do so that, you know, allows them to behave properly. And so for integration, precisely uh, defining the constraints of your parameter as tremendous value. But also, you know, we've talked about that at the beginning of the workshop. 
the teams in your company do not know what your API does, how it does it, and what are the constraints that you've put on parameters. And they cannot do their job, and security cannot do their job if you don't help them you know, understand what your API is supposed to support and what your API doesn't support. So when you put that, actually, it allows you to, to actually enable security in your company, but it also enables you to, to do a lot of things. And we've talked about the, the multiple integrations that an open API contract has in terms of, uh, for instance, uh, you know, testing. And you've got tools that will automatically can we test your API, your API according to this contract? So you, if you've defined patterns for your string, if you've defined minimum and maximum limits, you, you can do that. And that's actually also something that we do, uh, this automatic testing of your API against an API contract. We will get to that. But you know, de define that, define precisely what your API does, because what your API does is actually expose business logic and you, you know, your data to, to the world. So you better be precise in how you do that. In, you know, a few years back, uh, you know, APIs were hidden behind. No, APIs are everywhere because we've got service-oriented architectures that is spreading like wildfire and cloudification, um, you know, dra dramatically increase this, uh, this trend toward service-oriented architecture and microservices. So you, you should be very wary, wary of how you do things or you define things and actually defining things, designing things from the get go saying, okay, I will accept that and that and the constraints and the, these parameters will actually help you develop a more secure API because you will have all these constraints uh, in your mind. So yeah, you can go through the report, see all the issues. We actually give a lot of information, like an example code of what's wrong, a possible exploit scenario remediation, uh, what you could do to, to fix things. So I will not go through a whole lot of remediation here. I will just show you what a remediated version look like and I will commit it. But for instance, you know, I copy past it inside and I will show you what has changed in the file with just a, a diff. So on the left panel, you've got the initial version, right? And on the right panel, you've got the remediated version. So first of all, let's run a scan on the remediated, on the audit on the remediated version. And there you see, you know, you've got a, a pretty good uh, audit score, which is 89 out of 100. And uh, what has changed ba basically is we've defined as you see, you know, it was just uh, in this endpoint, which was the login endpoint, there was a, a user string that was passed, but it had no ma minimum length, no maximum length. So we've, we've defined a pattern, you know, what are the acceptable characters for this email? What is the minimum and maximum length for this email? And we do that for basically all endpoints. And we change, you know, the thing in what is a load, what is not a load, the minimum length, the maximum length. So it's really easy to actually increase your security posture. Uh, if you if you accept an array, say what are the minimum uh, item, items expected in this array, what are the maximum items expected in this array, uh, you define your your schemas in response. Response also is very important to define. We will get to that. And uh, yeah, basically at the end of the day, you've got this file that is remediated that has a pretty good score and that you can uh, safely uh, safely uh, commit. Remediated, pixie.json version. Well, yeah, and you can push that and now you've got, uh, you know, your APIs that will be built with this new, uh, this new thing. So you've got clever ways to actually generate code from a open API specification. If you start with a design first approach, where you define this API contract, then you can use things such as, for instance, Swagger, CodeGen. There are other tools, Open API Generator, for instance, that integrates with a lot of things like Maven, and you know, and you can actually generate complete, you know, stops uh, in different frameworks, different languages uh, for your API, and start coding from that. And you will have this uh, this clean design about what you what you accept, what what you return. So. Please, if there's any question during uh, the talk, I would uh, ask you, please ask them in the chat. And Isabel, if you see any question, please tell me because, you know, I'm um, just see the presentation that I'm doing right now. So let's get back to uh, to uh, to the issue. So the first one is if you define, you know, if, if you have something to fix, please first create uh, this contract. 
for your API, share them internally to your security team, define extensively what you have. But the other real big issue, and that's actually an issue that is found, you know, in a, there's this thing, the OWASP API security top 10 uh, issues, which is, you know, specific to APIs, what are the vulnerabilities in terms of broad categories on APIs, and you actually have three um, of the OWASP API security top 10 that are relating to uh, authentication and authorization. You've got the broken object level authorization, which was called uh, indirect object reference before, but now it's broken object level authorization or BOLA. It's, you know, API uses ID to manipulate objects, a JSON object, like you've got, a, I don't know, a, um, uh, for instance, a car, and you would have a car ID that you can use to retrieve information about that specific car. And when you want to modify this car, you will refer it, you know, by its ID. And broken object level authorization basically is not doing checks to ensure that the person doing the call uh, is authorized to actually either retrieve information or modify information about this specific object. So uh, that's something that should really be done at the uh, application level. Please check, verify every time that you've got a token that this actually, that this token, you know, actually uh, represents an authorization to modify this specific object because the person using this token is the owner or has access right to this object, a uh, read or write. Uh, the second one, and it's actually, you know, two of the, the, the first two of the OWASP API security top 10 are authentication and inauthorization, and it's broken, uh, broken user authentication. So, yeah, it's basically not verifying enough what, who is the owner of uh, this token and what, why does, you know, is this person the real person that is doing the thing? Because, for instance, you've got a login endpoint with poor login, and uh, it's a user password one, and, uh, and, yeah, it's unsafe in, in a lot of ways. So you, you could have broken user authentication everywhere. So be sure about how you do authentication. You've got frameworks to help you with that. And then there's broken function level authentication, uh, which is, you know, uh, actually an on point. Do you have security on it? And sometimes you forget to define globally on your API contract or on your API the fact that you will enforce uh, the, the need of a token to access this specific, uh, you know, uh, this specific endpoint. So really important, always validate the token. And when I say validate the token, is validate that the token is well formed. Validate the fact that uh, you know the um, the token grants access right to to the specific endpoint. Verify that the token grants access right to to, to the specific object. Do not forget to do that as something that's really important. That's the, the most important issue you could face with your APIs, the, the ones that are the most common. And you've got plenty of ways to, to implement tokens. You've got some really cool one, uh, new ones, like you know, macaroons and biscuit, which, uh, which are clever ways to, to handle token. Uh, if you are just using you know, a simple API, just you know, generating random tokens with a cryptographic, uh, a random number generator is pretty is really fine you know um, there's no problem with that and if you want to use for instance federated authentication then use uh, uh, things that are designed to do that like os2 with open id connect uh, every model every token you know every way to create a token has benefits really uh, you, you can discuss during hours about macaron and biscuits and OS2 and what they bring and which one is better. At the end of the day, it really depends on what you're trying to do. Um, in the resource seat at the end slide, you will have a link uh, from uh, Thomas Ptasek about uh, with really opinionated um, advice about, you know, which one is better on what are the, uh, uh, what are the advantages and drawbacks of each of one. So yeah, uh, OS2 and OIDC is extensively used and uh, sorry, it's not the, so yeah. Uh, what's OS2 and OIDC? So OS2 is an authorization framework and OIDC provides authentication. So authorization say, uh, do I have the right to do that? Authentication say, who is doing that? And uh, yeah, people often think of OS2 as a proof of authentication. It's not, if you want authentication, you've got uh, OIDC that you will have to use in conjunction with OS2. Uh, so use that if you need federated authentication. Um, 
if you want something really secure, you can use OS2 authentication code flows. Don't use implicit, uh, that's the industry standard to not use implicit anymore. Uh, no, you, uh, you you do things differently. It's not like it's that broken that it, the world will end and you will die. It's just that it's not good enough for today's standards. Also use uh, Pixie, which is a proof key um, basically for the client. The client will prove to the to the token generate uh, to the secure token service that he is actually the flow initiator. When you are using OS2, you initiate a flow, and when you are using authentication, you you initiate a flow. And this uh, this uh, actually uh, this thing Pixie will actually prove that uh, to to the token service uh, that it will send the token to, to the right client. It, it was something that was required for mobile application because mobile application, when you get to, when you follow an authentication flow, uh, you may be, uh, you know, it may be caught uh, on the, your mobile phone, the fact that you're trying to access this link and run directly to the other, to another uh, application instead of the one initiating the flow. And, you know, obviously an attacking application. So, even if it's not a must have for you, clients may evolve and it's actually become a you know industry standard to use Pixie for everything. So please do that. And yeah, uh, JOT tokens, uh, if you're using OS2 and OIDC, you will have JOT tokens and they can be really insanely complex. Uh, you know, it's uh, designed by committee. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's good and it's wrong on many levels. So when you get a token, you really have to ensure that the token is exactly how you want it to be formed. So you've got these headers, you've got this claim part, you've got this signature, you've got to validate everything. Uh, you've got to validate the fact that, you, that this is actually the algorithm that you want to accept. There was this attack a while back about you know null attacks on, on tokens. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, so, uh, so where you would change the uh, algorithm to null and so the framework would say, okay, I do not need to verify the signature. So please validate everything, validate that it's an algorithm you support, uh, validate uh, really anything. And don't forget that if you start using JOT, if you start using JOT tokens that are signed, you will need a trust store. If I may just add one little thing, sorry, on, yeah. on, on the JOT thing. Yeah. Um, not only, you know, this is really um, uh, something which is used a lot like in in for open id connect for example the the token is jwt it's mandated by by the standard okay yeah. and very often people don't realize that uh json web tokens are things that carry data so you really need to design that data and we, we see that a lot with our customers as well so a lot of our customers are using our, our platform to do jwt validation um the reason is that like anything in security you have to validate before you actually use something. So a lot of the uh, frameworks that exist for JWT validation, the first thing they will do, maybe even the only thing they will do is actually to just validate the signature. So just validate that pretty much that JOT has not changed in flight, right? And, and, and this is the first thing they will do. And really, you know, look at your frameworks, look at your JWT libs and make sure that before they actually look at the signature, they actually look at the contents. Right, so that you don't consume anything that has not been validated. We're starting to see SQL injections through uh, Jose headers. Um, you know, it's you know tricking the system and thinking that token has been issued by a different issuer than the one you should actually trust. There's a whole RFC around how to properly validate JOTs. Just go and make sure that your libraries actually do this properly because it's becoming a very strong uh, threat factor, actually. And I will just share an example of a simple, uh, you know, OS2 contract about, you know, we, it's, a, it's a simple beer API. So basically what it does, it, it allows you to, uh, to, to, to create a beer, uh, you know, and the beer is just a label or to get this label about a beer through an ID. And you know it's based on OS2, so the way you would define, for instance, uh, OS2 uh, in, um, in, a, in, a, in an API contract, there I use a client credentials flow, 
uh, and uh, I've defined the token URL and I've uh, created two scopes. One is a read beer, which is read writes on all beer objects, and write beer, which is write writes on all beer objects, right? And these are two scopes uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the token. And basically, what I, what I did is create one endpoint, one with a get and one with a patch to modify uh, you know, a specific beer object. Uh, the get one will accept a beer ID, and you see that the pattern is defined, minimum locks, maximum length. You've got the responses defined, success, generic error. And what we uh, do on this all endpoint is actually what Isabel was talking about, which is you know, validation. We say using you know, some kind of annotation that we've developed in your contract, if you want to do validation with 42 crunch of JOT tokens by using your firewall, you can actually do security as code or you will specify you know, a JOT token here and you say, okay, validate. Uh, the uh, Jose there according to this schema validates the claims according to this schema, right? And there, if you go, if you go there, you know it's uh, below, but you can see we won't delve a lot into uh, the details of how, how it's done. But basically, you 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 list everything that you allow. So for instance, here I only allow the RS uh, 384 uh, uh, algorithm, which is a RSA with a SHA 384. And yeah, so basically we restrict everything. We also uh, do actually rate limiting on this API. We've defined uh, this policy where we do a rate limiting, uh, like five, eight, in 10 seconds, and then we start rate limiting, right? And so, yeah, you've defined globally the fact that whatever endpoints you call, uh, you need you know, the client credential. So basically this host token with read beer scope so you know whatever endpoints there's only one but whatever endpoint you would call you would need that and for the post operation what we for the patch operation sorry what we define actually is we uh, implement we change the security to say okay there you need the right beer uh, uh, scope to be able to modify the thing so you know it's really easy to specify host to uh, authentication with open api uh, standard uh, don't don't forget just the fact that this is on the endpoint level. You're not talking about uh, a specific uh, user having the right to modify a specific object, which is you know this uh, bola thing. That's something that you really have to check inside the code of your API. But at the contract level, you can actually define who is allowed to access this specific endpoint. Yeah. So let's get back to the presentation and. Yeah, it's just, just uh, yeah, and I'm going to continue on this. Um, just one thing, you know, to relate to the product and the platform as well on, on all the security. So Pierre has shown you the, the uh, Visual Studio Code or plugin, which by the way is also available for IntelliJ or Eclipse, exact same functionality. And there is a part of the analysis that we do at the audit level that's all related to the security setup, right? And there's two things really that our customers do with this. Uh, a is, uh, bring to the developers the fact that you know we we said for example implicit is not a good idea right so we will report that they say listen you're using implicit are you sure this is what you want to do because it has a b c d problems and and we'll educate them on on why implicit it might not be a, the the right choice for, for for that api so that's one thing and the second thing is if you're in appsec and you want to say well like some our customers do uh, well, here we've decided across the board as a corporation, you know, that we will only allow OAuth with authorization code and, and making sure it's applied to every single API. So you, you can also, because the, the open API file that you have there that describes the security serves as the description of what the security should be, and this is static and text, you can actually enforce that automatically as well. So you could, at the platform level, say, whenever there is an API that goes through and we audit it, and it has a problem of type A, B, and C, we want to immediately report that to the developers and say, yeah, listen, you're using implicit here, but here we cannot do this because the, the security rules that we have you know, defined is we have to use authorization code. Or the security rules we have defined is JWTs must have X, Y, and Z inside, you know. So it's, it's you know, it's using uh, Open API as a single language across, again, all the consistency across the developers and across the AppSec teams. 
yeah. at the security level. And we'll talk about this at the data level as well. Okay. Yeah, we know, I guess we need to speed up a bit. Yeah. Um, so, and, and that gets into uh, that, that part uh, here, which is how do we enforce all those security rules? This is again, a key problem we see all the time, which is, okay, we want to enforce that everything needs to be uh, actually secured in a certain way. We want to catch those problems in the fact that things are not constrained properly. Right. If you want this to scale, then the only way this is going to work is because you're going to put this as an automated test within your security, within your pipeline, with your development pipeline. But in a way that you give an actionable report to your developers that they can, you know, see and fix this by themselves because they have this information. And, and why do you want to do this? Well, because the further down the, the line, you actually detect such problems the more expensive it's going to be. And you have some really, you know, I think mind blowing numbers here that have been um, uh, computed by the, the Poneman Institute on, on like in this case, like almost a one, 100, uh, you know, factor in terms of price between finding something at dev time and finding something at production time. And this is really why at 42 Crunch we're pushing into doing things at design time, right? Because that's that's where you're gonna be the most cost efficient in terms of finding and fixing the problems. Okay. So how, how is this uh, working, right? What can you do? Well, there's three different things that you can do really uh, in, in a general fashion and part, 42 Crunch is part of that, but there will be all the tools you will have to put inside your SDLC and it could be, you know, uh, code testing, for example, or it could be automated, um, you know, um, uh, functional testing, automated security testing. So you have three different stages, right? Continuous integration, continuous delivery, and then deployment. The, the sacred growl for us, like the growl that we're trying to really help our customers implement is that all of this and security is really part of all of these different phases. So at dev time, you have this audit that allows you to actually detect early those problems where it's really easy and less expensive to actually catch. So you will go and, and put those security gates in place that I was mentioning, like catching uh, non um, uh, problems that are not conforming to the, the corporate rules. Uh, then you will be able to automatically test your, your um, APIs um, against, again, leveraging that same contract. So in there, you will always have most likely your functional testing and low texting, et cetera. Well, there you wanna do security testing automatically. You really want to inject security testing as part of that flow. And then once, because you know, in, in our case, we're based on this contract and it's the single language across everyone, you can also deploy automatically protection uh, from there. So uh, I'm going to take also the opportunity to answer one of the questions, uh, start answering one of the questions we had in the chat here um, on, on how we actually do this. Um, so actually, Pierre is going to show you that uh, right now, like how do we uh, do this? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so it's basically the sch schema of how we do things. So we integrate in IDEs, you know, as you've seen, you know, with audit, uh, but you can also run an audit, a, a scan on, uh, on the CI CD pipeline. And uh, you can, um, after that, for instance, inject uh, an API firewall in front of your, of your API. If you are using Kubernetes, you can do things that are clever, you know, as uh, injecting a sidecar proxy to your API. And uh, I will show you this because we have uh, a pipeline. You saw me commit, uh, you know, this API a few uh, a few seconds uh, ago. And uh, no, I didn't push it, so I will push it. Yeah, I forgot to push that. Oh, that's bad. Okay, so you did not, but we will. See, uh, I will uh, just push the new version. And basically, what you see, you know, when you've got a node it you can see you know a job where you would have multiple stages basically what we do is we check out you know the api code then we audit the oas file and you know if you remember the, the first apis that we audited had a score of minute of 50 and we set you know the security gate in the pipeline to set okay we reject every api that has a score that is that is lower than 80. we also reject every api that are issues such as you know patterns not being defined or maximum length not being defined which is things that you might you know you might want to pinpoint specific issues because you've been hit by buffer overflows attack because you've been hit by you know memory uh, 
um, uh, starvation attacks and uh, things like that. So basically, you would be able to pinpoint exactly uh, in your pipeline what you want to accept and what you want uh, to, to, to reject. And the, the, the clever thing about that is as we integrate into IDEs, it's not this burdensome project for developers who are they actually try to commit something and then they have to get back uh, to why didn't it work. There they will be able to run the audit in the IDE so it doesn't come as a surprise. But you can also launch a conformance scan that didn't start in this uh, build because yeah, the audit failed and the build was broken. And you can, as you can see after that, you know, if everything is right, uh, you've got the audit, you've got proper contract and everything, and you launch this conformance scan, you can actually deploy a firewall uh, dynamically uh, uh, in front of your APIs that matches the contract. With 42 crunch, you can, uh, you, you can do that. And that's a way we do things and we help a uh, security team scale. And so the pipeline, the job, yeah, run perfectly. So now I've got this remediated API that has been, uh, you know, uh, scanned and, and run. And uh, basically, you know, if I go to this API and I try to do attack, uh, yeah, you, I would be able to register, to log in. And now if I do try to, 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 to do that, I can actually see in the firewall log that is non-blocking right now, but I can actually uh, see uh, the, the fact that there was this, uh, this uh, attack that would have been blocked because it doesn't conform to the contract. And for instance, there I try to use the parameter is admin, so targeting a vulnerability which is not a mass assignment and there is blocked because I do not have the right, it's not defining the API contract, the fact that I should be able to modify this, this thing. So that's the way we do it. And we, we do that by integrating in the, you, you can do the audit in the IDs. We integrate with, you know, uh, tools such as OCS, also Sonar Cube, so that you can use our, our tool in that. And yeah, and we, uh, so we're inside the IDs, inside the CI CD pipelines, we integrate with a lot of tools. We've got these clever little tools that are really lightweight, such as the firewall, you know, as the overhead is, is like, a, barely noticeable, you know, request processing 0 0.2 milliseconds. So yeah, you know, it's it's really nothing to, to validate all, all this thing for us. And uh, yeah, so let's get back to the presentation. And one other thing that you have to do, okay, you've got contracts, you, 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 you've, you've integrated security everywhere. You, you, you've, uh, you've, uh, worried about how you do your authentication or your authorization no please 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 think about data validation what you know what are the actual parameters what you do and validate everything innocuousness should never be assumed you know everything that goes to your api or from your api has got to be checked really and everything that goes from your api too because there's a lot of way, uh, you know, it can go wrong. There's this mass assignment issues that I just, you know, briefly shown uh, where you can actually, when you take an old schema and you just store it without verifying where, whether or not the, all the properties inside the schema, you, you should be able to, to store them. Then you've got this issue. You've got injection when, when you try to in, inject, you know, uh, for instance, SQL injection inside a parameter or a shell common inside the parameter. And basically, if you have validated that something is a number and is constrained between certain values, then you cannot inject SQL into that, right? It's a number and you've properly secured everything. You've got this allow list that, uh, that you built and that we've helped you build if you use our tool. But in terms of response, there's also this excessive data exposure and we will get to that in a second, but you, you've got really to va validate what your API, I guess. And uh, yeah, validate, and it's a non-extensive list. So the verbs, the paths, the query parameters, the body parameters, the headers, and everything. And the responses, as I said, and it's a, I've got the opportunity to talk about apisecurity.io, which is our basically community website where we talk about API security. It's not, you know, we don't talk about our product all the time. <laughs> On this website, we just talk about what is going, you know, in the API world in terms of security. You know, so you got clever resources about design uh, of APIs, of you know what, what has happened, who has been hacked, and why. So that we try to understand uh, together what are what is wrong with APIs and how we as a community uh, can fix that. And there's this problem with Chess.com, which I actually love, by the way, uh, that. Uh, at chess.com at, at the beginning of the year, where they actually 
replied uh, they, they've got this community feature where you know you you can add friends and everything and you can chat with people so you get to have this endpoint that give you specific information about somebody before you can even do something and they return everything on this endpoint the event return and that was the biggest vulnerability of that the session id which then could be used to actually do uh, uh, calls on the api with this specific session id uh, uh, as and you know to to spoof the legitimate user so uh, oftentimes you know people say we trust the server to behave correctly but what about an underlying exception that you might have in the code that could be valuable intel to attacker um and uh, yeah you can excessive data can leak as as we said and uh, yeah it, it has it's so wasp we actually help you find that uh, i'm going a bit fast because there's not much time left uh, but we, we've got conformance scan report you know in the pipeline we we see trend and basically what the conformance scan report if you use uh, you know 42 crunch will do is actually find all the way your API does not conform to the contract that you've designed. So if you, for instance, say that uh, the, your API only accepts you know, application uh, JSON, we will try some things like application random content type, and there, you know, it doesn't, it isn't as an issue for the API. So we've got a problem. When you say, okay, this API accepts a string there, what happens when we send a JSON object instead? Uh, no, what, and the, actually it's the inverse. It accepts an object and what happens when we send a string, an integer instead? And we will try to fuzz this API. So basically we are writing all these, uh, you know, <laughs> these tests about how your endpoint that you should actually write, but that we will help you uh, generate automatically according to the contract so that you can test that your API actually behaves properly and that you know all the things are are under you say it's an authenticated endpoint what happens when we try to call it without a token and this is a kind of testing that we will do and that will you help you first see whether where your assumptions about your api contracts were wrong and uh, what uh, you know what uh, your api is doing wrong also and uh, yeah, Isabel, we've got five minutes. Sure. No, well, that that's a good uh, thing. It would be easy. Well, you know, um, the, the the other thing that we see a lot. So everything related to data validation in bound and bound, we can all understand this is like a must. I mean, we've been told this for about thirty years now. Uh, one thing that people tend to forget is really about logging, and 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 we want to insist on this point because we see this against a lot of our customers. And you know, the title of this workshop is about uh, design time security. And one of the things you're going to need whenever there's a problem, you know, whichever the problem is, you're going to need traceability. You're going to need information that will allow you to go back in time and see what has happened. And here you have to be very careful and make the difference between things that you need to debug how your application is actually functioning and things which are events that are, you know, somebody logged in, somebody changed something, somebody you know, that data uh, got accessed, et cetera, et cetera. So you have those forensic events that you can have. Um, at a very high level, um, what I would really recommend is you use a framework of some sort that will allow you to, that you can give to your developers so that everyone also is using the same thing. Because you don't want, you know, team A doing logging in a certain way and team B doing it in a different way, right? So make sure you have all the information. You can change verbosity, right? But at non-debug level, you have enough information to know and observe what is going on in your system, right? And be careful, but again, that's why this is a design time problem. You really have to be careful about what it is that you actually log, you know? There, there are uh, dozens and billions probably of API keys and tokens written in logs all over the world if they are not written in GitHub, right? So you really have to be careful about that. And then you really have to push that information into a central place so that then you can have a visibility, graphical visibility of this, that you can do investigation of them with something like a CM. And, and Pierre is gonna you know, show a sample of that. I'm gonna show a sample of that. Um, so, so if you, this, this was drawn from the logs of our firewall, uh, for example, so you can push all this information. We have it there, you push it, and then you can see you know, the different access that have happened, where it came from, 
you can go and investigate specific IP, et cetera, et cetera. But if you don't have the information, then none of this will be possible. So care about your logs and care about the information you put in your logs. Yeah. And yeah, let's finish quickly. Uh, yeah, too often uh, a problem is that you've got no threat modeling. Uh, threat modeling is something that you should use. Uh, if you're a developer and you don't uh, want to, 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 to worry too much about that, use Stride, which is great for developer. You know, it's a, a framework that was developed by Microsoft where you basically will create uh, data flow diagrams of your application and you will evaluate each element according to Stride, which is spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information, disclosure, denial of service, or elevation of privilege. You've got also Pasta, you've got also Trike. So yeah, these are frameworks that can help you. Uh, please look at that. It will really help you improve uh, your security salt. And then Isabel, uh, you've got the aggravating issues. Uh, yeah, so what everything that we saw basically uh, can be made worse by the fact that you have no rate limiting. And uh, so please think about the rate limiting. Uh, please uh, focus on authentication and authorization endpoint and resource hungry endpoints when you design re re rate limiting, because that's where your API can be really uh, attacked and uh, you could have a denial of service. And if you've got data exfiltration issues, then it can all go wrong in a in a few seconds and just to conclude and sorry we've been a few minutes too long uh, developing securely is not buying a magic tool that will help you figure out where things are or, or how things work because that's not what security is about security and developing security securely uh, requires considerate people careful design integrated processes and team collaboration and the only thing that tools bring actually clever tool bring is that they bring that they bind that together and they help you scale and uh, yeah if we have something to say about security that was it we've got a few resources that you can have you know uh, open api i think api uh, we've got this introduction to us to an oidc uh, by Prama pragmatic web security uh, the, the survey about tokens i told you about how to use a stride um, uh, methodology, uh, how to create the data flow diagrams. And uh, yeah, uh, you've got uh, the resources we talked about. And if you want to use our tools, then you can register on our platform on platform.42crunch.com. And you've got you know all this documentation about how to do audit, how to do scan, how to do protection. And you've got these tutorials as that you have. And if you need anything more, please just ask. And that's it. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And um, don't hesitate to go by the booth and, and talk to us. We'll be there in a few seconds. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nicola.